Pugs of the Frozen North, Chapter 6. The town of Snowdovia was built in the same style as the Poe of Ice, on stilted platforms along a fjord edge. But unlike the Poe of Ice, it was full of life and bustle. People lined the balconies outside their homes to watch as the adventurers who meant to race to the top of the world came sledding into their fjord. From all over the north they came. True winter had not arrived completely without warning. Not for people who knew what to look for. Not for people who had been eagerly waiting for the first flake of magical snow to fall. They had been preparing for weeks and now that the ice had come, they were ready. At Limpetville Institute of Technology, Professor Shackleton Jones had known about the coming winter by the excited way that to the northern lights made his particle detectors ping. He was determined to reach the top of the world using the power of science. He and his robot companion, Snowbot, swept into Snowdovia on a carbon fibre sled so strong and lightweight that it was barely there at all. On a lonely island not far from Snowdovia, Helga Hammerfest had learned of the big freeze by watching the flight of geese and the way the spiders spun their cobwebs. She'd readied her sled and harnessed up her team. No dogs for Helga, just her two pet polar bears, Snowdrop and Slush Puppy. She was the local favourite, so she got an extra big cheer when her snow bears came lumbering up to the starting line. Sir Basil Sprout Dumpling heard of the freeze from his butler, Sideplate, who'd been keeping watch on the weather forecasts. Ten minutes later, they were at the airport, loading Sir Basil's sled and pedigree dog team aboard an aeroplane. Sir Basil's father had been the first to reach the top of the world last time True Winter came. He'd met the snow father and had his wish granted, which was to be ridiculously rich. He'd gone back to England with a fortune in rubies, sapphires and diamonds. But Sir Basil had spent it all. If we don't beat these riffraff to the pole, side plate, he said as they drew up to the starting line, I shall have to sell off my old stately home. I mean to win this race, even if I have to cheat like an absolute bounder. Yes, Sir Basil, said Side Plate sadly, holding his bowler hat on tight and wishing he'd worn warmer underwear. But if I may say so, Sir Basil, I do hope cheating won't be necessary. Sir Basil wasn't listening. I say, he cried, for the pink sled that had just pulled up next to him held none other than Mitzi von Prim, most glamorous of all the racers. How embarrassed her team of huskies looked, clipped like poodles and dyed pink to match Mitzi's style racing outfit. Those four were not the only entrants for the race. There were dozens of others, modern sleds with sat-nav and central heating, age-old sleds of wood and bone, a sled folded out of stiff paper by an origami master from Japan, and an inflatable sled advertising, Poo be gone, poop scoops. There was even a sled crewed by two ladies who were doing the race for charity, dressed as a pantomime zebra. It took quite a while to get them all sorted out and arranged along the starting line. The overexcited dogs woofed and yapped and howled and sniffed each other's bottoms and started fights. The overexcited race marshals skated to and fro, checking that nobody was cheating and no dog, or polar bear, had its nose over the line. They'd almost finished and the chief marshal was just cleaning the snow out of her starting pistol and getting ready to fire it when people standing near the fjord's edge began to shout, Wait, wait! Here comes another! A ripple of applause spread along the fjord's side as the late arrival headed for the starting line. That looks like young Seeker in her grandpa's old sled, said the chief marshal, scraping away the ice that had formed on the lenses of her binoculars. But what are those little woolly things pulling it? They look like 66 pugs, said her assistant. Pugs, said the chief marshal. Pugs, said the other racers, turning to stare as Seeker steered the old sled into a gap between Sir Basil's and Mitzi von Prim's. And Shen reined in the eager little dogs. I say, complained Sir Basil, as the marshals came skating over to take the name of the new arrivals. They've got 66 dogs. That's against all the rules. And those dogs are wearing woolly jumpers, agreed Mitzi. I'm not sure that's allowed. But Helga Hammerfest, whose sled was on the other side of Mitzi's, said, 
Well, dear, your huskies are dyed pink and have ribbons in their fur. I don't think you'll find that mentioned in the rule book either. Mitzi blushed, and her poor pink dogs all hung their heads in shame. And Shackleton Jones' sled is pulled by robot dogs, Helga pointed out. Those are Woofotron 2000s, my very latest invention, said Shackleton Jones proudly. And those 66 little dogs are each about a tenth of the size of one of yours, Sir Basil, Helga went on. And you've got eight, so you've got more dog power than these youngsters. What's the matter? Afraid that smart sled of yours won't be as fast as their antique? Of course not, said Sir Basil, but he didn't say it very loudly, because Helga was half as tall again as him, and twice as wide, and he didn't fancy getting into an argument with her. Also, her polar bears kept giving him very nasty looks. So the chief marshal wrote Shen and Seeker's names on her clipboard and stepped into the little balloon that was waiting on the fjord side to carry her up above the starting line. Shen and Seeker had left the Po of Ice in a terrible hurry, having quickly packed the sled with supplies for themselves and the pugs. All the way to Snowdovia, they'd been worrying that they'd be too late. Now Seeker turned to Shen and beamed. We did it. Shen was not so sure. They were in the race, but that was only the beginning. How could they hope to win it when the other sleds looked so speedy? when the other sleds looked so speedy and the other dogs so big and strong. Still, it would be something just to start. The sound of all the dogs filled the frosty air and made him feel eager to be off. He waved at Helga and said, Thank you, sir. She's a lady, hissed Seeker. Is she? asked Shen. I am, said Helga Hammerfest. But don't worry, I'm always getting mistaken for a man on account of my size and also my beard. Most ladies don't care for beards, but I find mine helps to keep my chin warm in the frozen north. You should try growing yours, Miss Mitzi. Mitzi von Prim shuddered. My fur-lined racing coat is all I need to keep me warm, she said. It's by a very good designer, you know. The chief marshal interrupted, drifting above them in her balloon and shouting through a huge megaphone. Her words boomed across the ice and broken bits of them came bouncing back from the frozen hillsides. Welcome to the great northern race. Now you all know the course, north through the night forest, then over crack and deep, and then by whatever route you want to the palace at the top of the world. Good luck. Give our regards to the snow father and may the best sled win. Then she fired her starting pistol. The racers cracked their whips and hollered at their dogs and the sleds set off, rushing across the ice. There were some disasters right away, which was only to be expected with so many sleds all starting out together. Some tangled in each other's runners. Some of the dog packs stopped running and started fighting. A speedy Russian sled crashed nose first into a hole, which opened suddenly in the ice. Sir Basil chuckled and tossed away a can of antifreeze. A small avalanche, triggered by the noise, came rushing down the fjord side and crumpled the origami sled before it had gone ten metres. The inflatable sled popped when one of the dogs pulling the sled behind it mistook it for a huge runaway sausage and took a bite. And three sleds were knocked over when the chief marshal's balloon fell on top of them. She'd accidentally punctured it when she fired the starting pistol. But the others were away. Shackleton Jones was in the lead with Sir Basil close behind until Mitzi von Prim took a daring shortcut between two jagged rocks and overtook them both. Helga's polar bears galloped lazily along, not bothering to go too fast yet. And right at the back, pulled by their 66 panting pugs, came Shen and Seeker. It's no good, shouted Shen, clinging on tight as they left the smooth ice of the fjord and started bounding and bouncing over snowy ground. They'll be at the top of the world long before us. Maybe not, said Seeker. It's not just about being fast, it's about luck. It would take at least a week to reach the North Pole. All sorts of things will happen on the way. What will you wish for if you get there first? What's your heart's desire, Shen? I don't know, said Shen. He'd been thinking about it a lot as the sled whisked along. He supposed he ought to wish for a family. 
He'd never had one of his own, except for Bo and Mungbean and Captain Jeggings, who didn't really count. But he didn't want a magic family, just an ordinary one. So he said, I'm still thinking about it. I know exactly what I want, said Seeker. I'll ask the Snowfather to make Grandpa well again, to let him live another life lifetime, so he'll have a chance to race again next time true winter comes. Can the Snowfather really do that, wondered Shen. Of course he can, he can do anything. Shen looked back and wished that he knew what to wish for. He saw that the fjord had... Oh, sorry. He saw that the fjord and the starting line had already fallen far behind. Zzzz, went the runners, racing over snow and ice. Ooh, went the wind, whistling around the sled. And the 66 pugs went yip, 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 y